glad you made it back to Anna Uncovered. Have you ever felt betrayed by your high school buddies or even your best friends? Well, few teenage betrayals go as badly as they went for Skylar Niece. She was a bright 16-year-old girl with nothing but A grades and her whole life ahead of her. She trusted her two best friends with her life, but sadly, that was a terrible mistake. What Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schof did to their friend is beyond the stuff of nightmares. This case is about to get very upsetting, but if you're ready for it, let's dive in. Skylar was born on February 10th, 1996 to Mary and Dave Neese. Mary worked as a medical assistant and Dave was a product assembler at Walmart. Tell me about the day she was born. Was that the greatest moment of your life? I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> First time you saw her? First time I saw her, yes. I can say that was the greatest moment of my life. Yeah, it was instant love. Skylar, Mary, and Dave lived together in Star City, a tiny, peaceful suburb in West Virginia. Skylar was a very smart and sociable girl. As early as nursery school, she made a best friend, Morgan. Morgan was another only child, and they were pretty much sisters. Either Morgan would be at Skylar's place, or Skylar would be at Morgan's. What are your memories of Skylar when she, when she was this high? She giggled all the time. It just filled our house. She had the biggest eyes. <laughs> You just wanted to hug her. Skylar and Morgan grew up together, up until they were high school girls with career goals. Morgan wanted to become a meteorologist and Skylar, a criminal lawyer. They had also made a vow to each other. And you would both be in each other's wedding parties? Everyone has a sister to put in their wedding and we had each other. But with high school came new friends and Skylar started drifting apart from Morgan. She was still a social animal and she would have a gang of her own at Morgantown University High School. Friends came first with her. She was always about hanging out with friends if she didn't have work or school. Skylar had soon found two BFFs, Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoff. They were also only daughters. Soon the trio was inseparable and they proudly called themselves the Three Musketeers. Now all their pictures showed the three of them together. Most of the fun the girls had together was of the naughtier kind. Sneaking out at night, smoking in the forest, doing ever so slightly dangerous things, and worrying their parents every day. But Skylar's parents weren't more worried than any other regular teenage parent. She's a straight A student who loves her parents. Did you sort of chalk it up to, okay, we're not thrilled, but she's a teenager? Exactly. Skylar had known Sheila since they were about eight years old, as their families lived close to each other and were friends. But as Sheila got closer to Skylar and they started calling themselves sisters forever, Dave and Mary started thinking that something was off with Sheila. We started having weird feelings about Sheila from the time she moved here. Of course she can't pick your child's friends. So we just tried to accept her. Sheila felt like she was the center of the universe. If it didn't involve her, she didn't care about it. But although they weren't too fond of Sheila, never did Skylar's parents think that their daughter would be in danger around her BFFs. After all, they were just a bunch of rowdy 16-year-olds. In the summer of 2012, Skylar had finished her first high school year and decided she was going to work for a few months. She got a job at Wendy's and enjoyed every shift there, earning her first pocket money and feeling more independent. On July 5th, Skylar got home from her shift at Wendy's. She put her arm around her mom, gave her a kiss, and gave her a hug and said, I love you, mom. She turned to me and said, I love you, dad. And she went to the room. That was the last time Dave or Mary would see their daughter alive. On July 6th, around noon, Dave came into Skylar's room during his lunch break at work. He wanted to eat with his daughter, but her bed was unmade and her window was cracked open. I thought she was out with one of her other friends. I figured they went swimming or shopping. Since no one knew where Skylar could be and she wasn't answering her phone, Dave called her best friend, Sheila. So I called Sheila. I said, have you seen Skylar? She said, no. I said, when's the last time you talked to her? She said, last night, about midnight. Dave stepped outside the house, panicking, and that's when he saw something truly strange. 
Skylar's bedroom window, which was on the ground floor, was slightly open, and a tiny bench was placed outside under the window. Dave was now angry at Skylar. It looked as if she'd run away from home. But at this time, I called Skylar herself. I said, hey, you're in trouble. You better be calling me right away. So I called herself on about 10 times. I called Mary again. Mary was putting on a brave face and trying to stay calm and rational until Skylar turned up. She knew her shift at Wendy's would start at 4 p.m. the next day, so she and Dave decided to wait for their daughter to get to work and call work. But before Mary could ring Wendy's, she got a phone call. They called us first, wanting to know if she was yeah. coming to work. Was yeah. that a big moment for you? Yeah. Mary could hardly contain her tears at the thought of her daughter being gone forever. But she didn't want to believe it yet. She was frantically searching for answers when she got another call. It was Sheila. She said that she had to tell me the truth. And I said, well, what truth? She said, well, we did, we snuck out last night. This made sense, right? Skylar had left that tiny bench under her window so she could climb back up and act as if nothing happened the next day. Also, Skylar had snuck out with Sheila and Rachel before. They'd gone out for a late night drive around town, but the police caught them out after town curfew and sent them home. So perhaps Sheila was telling the truth and the girls tried to do the joy ride once more. But then why hadn't Skylar come home? I said, where did you go? Where's Skylar? And she said that Skylar insisted they drop her off at the end of the street so we wouldn't hear her sneaking back in. Piecing the given information together, Dave and Mary figured out Skylar might have been abducted from the end of the street to their home. Immediately, Dave rang the police. I have a daughter that's 16 years old. Apparently she snuck out of her room last night and she hasn't been seen since. None of her friends can get all over. I can't find her. Hey, what's her name? Skylar Neese. Star City has a population of 1,800, so immediately Skylar's disappearance made the headlines and struck a chord with every resident. Skylar going missing was a tough pill to swallow for the entire community. When the police officer Jessica Colbank took Skylar's case, she first assumed it was a runaway. There are several cases of teenagers running away from their families, temporarily or not. But there were two things that didn't add up. First. Skylar had left the bench under her window, which meant she had planned to come back. Second, Jessica looked at the video from the security cameras on the niece's house. It showed Skylar getting into a car at 12.30 a.m. This car doing pulling up around 12.30 a.m. Who was in it? Dave Niece watched horrified as there on the tape out walked Skylar. The problem was that Sheila had said that she drove Skylar back to her house at midnight and that she and Rachel went to bed afterward. So who was driving this car? And why did Skylar hop into it? Slowly walked down to a car that was sitting there waiting on her. And she got in the back seat, I could tell that. And she drove away. Mary and Dave were working with the police to uncover the story behind their daughter's disappearance. But as they connected the security camera footage to Sheila's story, they had convinced themselves that Skylar had snuck out a second time at 12.30 a.m with someone other than her BFFs. After all, why would her best friend lie? Furthermore, the footage had such low resolution that the police couldn't identify the make of the car or the license plate. And because Skylar could be seen leaving on her own accord, the police couldn't issue an Amber Alert either. Once that video came out that she willingly got in this car, they're not gonna come out and look for somebody driving around in a car. While the nieces were getting desperate and hopeless, Sheila started visiting their place and saying how worried she was about Skylar's disappearance. Once, she asked Mary if she could go into Skylar's room. And yes, that's fine. I went to Skylar's room with her. We sat on the bed. Sheila cried. She was saying, how could she do this to us? I'm her best friend. Why doesn't she at least call me? Remember these lines as they're about to get very dark. A few months into the investigation, the West Virginia police told Mary and Dave that they thought Sheila and Rachel were more involved than they let on. In fact, they became the main suspects in Skylar's disappearance. 
knew that the last person with somebody is usually the person who knows what happened to them. This was impossible to conceive for Dave and Mary. They were an inseparable trio who always seemed happy together and as tight-knit as a friend group can be. Now, Sheila and Rachel were active members of the community searching for Skylar. They would knock on the doors and ask, have you seen this girl? And we kept showing the pictures to people and nobody had seen her. So if Sheila and Rachel were so desperate to find Skylar, why would they lie about the night of July 6th? But Sheila's game was strong. She even seemed worried about her best friends. She kept telling her bestie, Chrissy, that she is really worried about Skylar. She was trying so hard to help them find anything, so hard to help them figure out what had happened. When Star City organized a candlelit vigil for Skylar, Sheila and Rachel came and sat in tears next to Skylar's parents. They were crying, came up and hugged me and Mary, just crying her eyes out. The only thing Mary could say was, what can we do to help these girls? But Mary was trying to offer comfort and closure to the two people that had murdered her daughter. She had no idea what the two girls had done to Skylar on that fateful night and what lengths they would go to to conceal the horrific truth. It was towards the end of 2012 that Jessica excluded the possibility of Skylar running away. Usually runaways, they take items with them that they want, especially if she had contacts and glasses. She didn't take that stuff with her. Skylar hadn't used her phone or an ATM since July 6th the night she disappeared. Around the same time, the police turned their attention toward two bank robberies in Blacksville, a neighboring city. Detective Ronnie Gaskins was put in contact with the Star City Police after a tip that Skylar had gone partying with the robbers when she disappeared. There's just rumors, you know, gossip going around that there was this teenage party, uh, there was a possible overdose and people there were scared, so they hit the body. But Skylar had never used heavy or gone to huge underground parties. However, Ronnie didn't know this for sure. He and Jessica followed rumors and sightings of Skylar all over the United States to no avail. All the while, the answer was right there in Star City. Mary and Dave Neese weren't the only ones shaken by Skylar's disappearing without a trace. Back at school, several of her friends were finding it hard to adjust to a world without her. But students seemed to know more than the parents. Rumors were spreading to all social media platforms. Between Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, you just see things start to get ridiculously out of control. By out of control, Morgan means that the rumors were simply very diverse and very, very many. Some said Skylar had OD'd, some that she had changed the country, but students who were closer to Sheila and Rachel, like Daniel, were starting to paint a different story. There had been rumors going around, just, oh, Rachel and Sheila know where she's hiding. Daniel was sure Sheila and Rachel were trying to protect someone either Skylar, themselves, or someone else involved in her disappearance. There were probably a good three, four, five times where I told Rachel, if you know anything, you need to say what happened or where she's at. Soon enough, both Twitter and Facebook were swarming with posts about Sheila and Rachel hiding something. In September, the FBI arrived at Morgantown University High School. They interviewed every student who is a colleague or friend of Skylar's. And they asked several questions about Sheila and Rachel. Daniel told them that the girls didn't seem different after July that year, but they did seem more secluded and close to each other. Meanwhile, Mary and Dave simply couldn't believe that Sheila or Rachel had been involved. If anything, they were trying to protect them from all the stress the FBI was causing. I even went to the police and said, will you leave Sheila alone, please? I said, you guys are harassing her 24-7. The kid's going through enough right now. Leave her alone. But Ronnie knew Sheila had something to hide, and he continued to interview her. How was Sheila's demeanor in these meetings you would have with her? Calm, collect, just would look at you right in the face, right in your eyes. But it was a whole different story with Rachel. She would refuse to make eye contact, and she seemed very distracted. She would draw on the desk play with the pencil. Just her nonverbal cues spoke a lot. Both girls kept saying the same story over and over again. 
They picked up Skylar before midnight, drove around for a bit, smoked some then dropped her off at the end of the street at midnight. But they refused to give any more details. And at the same time, the police were starting to collect physical evidence. CCTV footage from a gas station showed Sheila's car heading west towards Blacksville, not east like she said. Rachel's phone had also pinged off a cell tower in Blacksville that night. That was an aha moment. Finally, we have something to go on that's different from their story. By now, Dave and Mary had accepted that the two girls were hiding something. They were posting on social media too, urging the girls to come forward with the real story behind Skylar's disappearance. I started posting on Facebook things about karma, karma will get you, you can't hide. We were pushing. We were pushing the girls to get them to say what happened. In November, Rachel succumbed to the police pressure for the first time. Asked about the Blacksville footage, she admitted that they did drive there, but she said Skylar had asked them to drop her off there. The next day, Sheila told the police the exact same story, word for word. At school, Sheila kept her calm, but Rachel couldn't do it anymore. Rachel seemed distressed. She seemed like she was very upset over something. I mean, this was eating in her heart. It was January 2013, and six months had passed since Skylar's disappearance. Dave and Mary hadn't celebrated the winter holidays and had entered a hopeless, depressed state of mind. Sheila and Rachel had stopped coming to school. Rachel was fighting constantly with her parents, up to the point where her mom called 911. I have an issue with a 16-year-old daughter of mine. I mean, I can't control her anymore. The situation had escalated past raising voices and calling names. She's hitting us, she's screaming, she's running through the neighborhood. Give me the phone. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, this is over, this is over. My husband's trying to contain her. Please hurry. Do you hear those blood-chilling screams in the background? Rachel had simply lost all control over her emotions. She couldn't bear hiding the truth anymore. Rachel was picked up and taken to a mental health facility in town. Two days later, she contacted Ronnie, asking to meet at her lawyer's office. I remember her pulling up a wastebasket next to her. She's afraid she's gonna throw up. And then he started asking her the questions that we thought she would answer. Did she overdose? Was there a party? And I remember she just, her face got really red and she just, you know, glanced at us and said we stabbed her. The real story about Skylar's death was a very dark one. Sheila and Rachel had been planning Skylar's death for months prior to July, plotting its exact details and perfect timing while meeting with Skylar and acting like BFFs. On July 5th, Rachel got a shovel from her father's home and put it in Sheila's trunk. They then prepared sets of clean clothes, cleaning products, and big kitchen knives from Sheila's home. At 12.30 a.m. on July 6th, Rachel and Sheila got to Skylar's place. They had convinced her to come on a night drive with them. Skylar walked to their car and to her death. The three girls drove to Blacksville and stopped at the edge of a forest to have a chat and smoke. Once the girls were out of the car, they told Skylar they'd forgotten to bring a lighter. Skylar said she'll go to the car and get hers. When she turned her back to the girls, Rachel said, on three. Sheila and Rachel counted to three and began Skylar with the knives they had kept hidden in their hoodies. They attacked her with all their physical strength. Skylar ran away, but could only make it a few feet. Rachel tackled her to the ground and s***ed her chest. Skylar kept fighting. She grabbed Rachel's knife from her hand and cut her ankle, but she couldn't defend herself from both girls. Did Rachel indicate what Skylar's last words were, her final moments in that meeting? She said, Skylar just said, why? And that was, that's all she said. But the girls said nothing and let their former friend die in agony, wondering what was happening and what she had done to deserve this. Once Skylar's neck wasn't making any more gurgling sounds, the girls tried to dig a hole and bury her, but the ground was hard and rocky. 
Eventually, they just left her body next to a creek and covered it with rocks and branches. Then, they cleaned themselves and changed into fresh clothes before driving off and returning to their lives as if nothing had happened. When Ronnie asked Rachel why they had done this, she just said they didn't like Skylar. I don't know about you, but if I don't like someone, I just don't hang out with them. Anyway, the police were just befuddled at Rachel's answer and were trying to dig deeper into the girl's motivation and the whole story. Meanwhile, detectives found the murder scene Rachel had described just on the border of Pennsylvania. There, Skylar's remains were found and identified. The police notified Mary and Dave of a body being found, but they didn't tell them about Rachel's confession. It was part of an ongoing investigation and they didn't want the nieces to tamper with it. News of Skylar's death traveled fast and the community was all grief struck. I remember the first thing I felt, it was just like a surreal of, I know she's not, you know, out there. Star City Police did not arrest Rachel as soon as she made her confession. Ronnie wanted to use her to make Sheila incriminate herself. And he was right. Knowing Rachel's vulnerable position, Sheila came forward. She tweeted this photo with herself and Rachel captioned, finally got to see. The police went to Sheila's home with a warrant and seized every kitchen knife in there. They also seized Sheila's car and found DNA inside her trunk. While they sent it to the lab and waited for the results, the police also made the news public of Skylar's body being found. The university high school community was shaken by the news and confused as to Sheila and Rachel's involvement. Sheila, as always, seemed very upset at the loss of her best friend. And once Skylar's body was found, Sheila seemed like she was so upset to have lost her best friend. She couldn't believe that something like this would happen. She even asked me, how could someone do this to Skylar? Sheila put on a show meant to convince everyone around her that she was devastated by Skylar's death. Rest easy, Skylar. You'll always be my best friend. I miss you more than you could ever know. But Ronnie wasn't done with Sheila. The police were all too aware of Sheila's other social media posts, the happy, casual pictures she kept posting with Rachel. The locals would whisper in each other's ears and say, how are they still free? Most people in Sheila's close circle suspected she'd done it. If there were any doubts about it, on March 31st, she tweeted, we really did go on three. Meaning she and Rachel did count to three and then stabbed their former best friend. She was getting cocky like many murderers do when they're not caught in the first few months. It's unbelievable that she feels she's so invincible to, to tweet this publicly. Just in time, the DNA results came back from the lab. Skylar's DNA was found in Sheila's car trunk. This was probable cause to finally arrest Sheila. By mid-April 2013, Sheila and Rachel were finally in prison. Sheila was arrested in a parking lot and charged with first-degree murder. She'd just had lunch with her mother. Sheila was crying and she kept asking her mother, is, is everything gonna be okay? And then her mother, just, I don't know Sheila. On May 1st, Rachel pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for cooperating with the police. But when Sheila was brought to court, she smiled defiantly and pleaded not guilty. Dave and Mary still had a long way to go in getting any kind of justice. I don't want to go through a trial and hear the grisly, gruesome details of all this. That would tear me apart. As everyone was getting ready for a lengthy and tiring trial, the police were trying to get to the bottom of the motive. Why had Sheila and Rachel killed Skylar? Not liking her simply didn't make sense. As the police talked to the students, they started painting a dark picture. Morgan told the police how she had a bad feeling about Rachel and Sheila from the moment Skylar started hanging out with them. This wasn't jealousy on her behalf, just worries about the disturbing dynamic between them. She hung out with the wrong crowd. She had lots of friends that were 20 some years old. That's just a little strange. Not just that, but the three were literally inseparable at school. They wouldn't spend a minute apart. And Skylar seemed to change as a result of her time with them. It seemed like about that time, she didn't have that same nice 
quality to her. She was more sour, I think, toward people. She started almost acting the way that Sheila acted. Sheila was a defiant, arrogant bully, and her energy spread onto Skylar. By the spring of 2012, the three-way friendship didn't work anymore. Sheila and Rachel wanted to spend more and more time together, and less and less time with Skylar. Schoolmates would hear the two diss Skylar whenever she wasn't around. One time, Skylar's classmate Fantasia heard something truly disturbing from Rachel. Rachel was ranting to me how much she didn't like Skylar one day. Well, she said word for word, I'm pretty sure it was, I wouldn't mind if she died at this point. Skylar knew all too well that their relationship wasn't going great. She didn't trust her friends anymore. Less than 24 hours before she died, Skylar tweeted this about Sheila. You doing blank like that is why I will never completely trust you. But somehow, Sheila convinced Skylar to come with her and Rachel for a drive that night. As months passed and the police worked hard to create a complete picture of the girl's motives, they discovered a strong rumor that Sheila and Rachel had developed an intimate relationship and started feeling that three's a crowd. Of course, they could have just stopped hanging out with Skylar. Instead, they decided they had to kill her and make sure Skylar didn't tell people about their relationship. In January 2014, Sheila was finally sentenced to life in prison with a possibility for parole after 15 years. Sheila, Eddie, how do you plead to the offense of murder in the first degree of the felony charged in count three of the indictment in this case? Guilty. Sheila's attorney read a statement apologizing to Skylar's family for all the pain caused by her and Rachel. Rachel was devastated by her actions, and this could be seen before her arrest. At the trial, she spoke directly to Skylar's parents. I don't know if there's a proper way to make this apology, because there are not even words to describe the guilt and remorse that I feel each day for what I've done. I became scared and caught up in something that I did not want to do. I never realized the gravity of my actions and how many people I've hurt. Hearing this, Dave told Rachel to take her apology and sit on it as it won't bring any justice to his dead daughter. She can take her apologies to everything else and sit on them because that's about what they're worth. Rachel was sentenced to 30 years in prison with a possibility for parole in 10 years. The niece family will be forever ridden with guilt and regret over not knowing the girls better. But there had to be a sign somewhere. There had to be a clue. Sheila and Rachel's former friends are also deeply shaken by the event and have trust issues to this day. How can you befriend new people when you once were besties with a couple of murderers? Not only did Sheila and Rachel kill their friend in cold blood, they went on to hide it and even pretend they were deeply worried about their friend. Their dishonesty and premeditation in the murder and its concealment are no less than pure evil. Thanks for watching, you guys. Don't be shy. Give this video a like and subscribe to our channel for more. See you next time and stay safe.